Hello, and good evening to this episode of ESR Connect, focusing on COVID-19. My name is Helmut Posch, and I'm a thoracic radiologist from the Medical University of Vienna. Today, we will focus on complications in COVID-19. And to do that, we invited a very distinguished panel of speakers. Michael Oana from Strasbourg will talk about ARDS and lung fibrosis. Then Anand Devaraj from London will talk about pulmonary embolism. And last but not least, Miriam Edgelil Gouchon, I don't know how to pronounce that, from Paris, will talk about neurological complications. So very important topics. And I would like to invite all of you to ask your questions. We will discuss and try to discuss all of your questions. You can ask them also during the presentation so that you don't forget them. And uh, this is also a first that we have a we've got an accreditation for one CME point for this webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to invite all of the speakers to introduce themselves. So let's start off with Michael Oana from Strasbourg. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Michael Oana. I'm a radiologist in uh, Strasbourg University Hospital in France. Uh, I'm specialized in chest and cardiovascular imaging. Um, my main research interests are low-dose and ultra-low-dose chest CT and also uh, artificial intelligence in uh, image reconstruction. Thank you so much. Moving on to Anand. Thank you, Helmut. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Arnon Devraj, I'm a thoracic radiologist from the Royal Brompton Hospital and Imperial College in London. And the neurologic complications will be covered by Miriam Edgelil Gouchon. Thank you, Elwood. Um, so, yes, my name is Miriam Edgelil Gouchon. I'm a MD, PhD. I'm uh, working both in uh, Hôpital Raymond Poincaré Garch and the Saint Anne Hospital in Paris. Uh, my main uh, research interests are strokes, intracranial aneurysms, and also infectious disease. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of you to, for your participation today. So, with no further ado, I'd like to hand over the microphone to Michael, and he will talk about now the, the pulmonary complications in COVID-19. Thank you, Helmut. So we'll talk about ARDS and lung parenchyma complications. So regarding ARDS, ARDS is the most dreaded complication and the number one morbidity uh, in COVID-19 patients. And the incidence of ARDS was reported to be up to 30% of patients in initial reports. In Strasbourg, we had about 3,000 patients during the whole epidemic wave. And you see that in the peak of epidemic, so during about 80 days, 80 days, we had almost 100 patients that directly went from the ID to the ICU for ARDS. So it was about an 8% rate. So this is still uh, quite uh, frequent. Regarding the diagnosis of ARDS, how is the diagnosis done? So the diagnosis is based on Berlin criteria. This is uh, international guidelines. It's based on the uh, first acute hypoxemia, which is something which is uh, uh, constated by the intensivist based on PAO2 and FeO2. And with that, you have to have bilateral radiographic opacities, either at chest uh, X-rays or chest CT. So the radiographic opacity, they are always there for COVID-19 patients, which means that the diagnosis of ARDS is not based on imaging, it's based on the criteria of hypoxemia. So the problem is not the diagnosis. Radiology won't help for diagnosis. The problem are prediction and follow-up of this patient. So first point, the prediction. Can we predict the risk of ARDS at the initial chest CT of a COVID-19 patient. So there are a few papers in the literature, not so much. These are the main three papers that are available. And basically they have all tried to do some kind of score. So score based on uh, either a quantitative assessment or on, on either a visual assessment of each lobe. And then you have different type of scroll, which is not really uh, something that is uh, reproducible or highly reproducible. And they have correlated it with the prognosis of the patient. 
this type of semi-quantitative score, it takes time, it's not really standardized, so I would advise to go very simple and use the ESR and the ESTI visual scale. It is simply based on the extension of the lesion, whatever the lesions, ground glass opacities, consolidation, crazy paving, so whatever the lesions, you take the extension of the whole lesions over the lung parenchyma. And then you classify in five different levels, less than 10%, 11 to 25, 26 to 50, 51 to 75, and more than 75. And with this very simple visual quantification, which can be done readily for any patient, well, in our experience, in about 200 patients, the first 200 patients, if you have less than 25% lung involvement, the risk of going to ICU or to be dead is about 18%. And if you have more than 25%, the risk is much more higher. So this is really simple and it can help to predict the risk of ARDS on the initial chest CT, which is extremely useful if you use the CT as a triage tool for ED patients. So that's the first question, question of prediction. So the second question is about the risk of fibrosis. We know from a prior publication in type, other types of ARDS not related to COVID-19 that from 50 to 75% of patients after ARDS are at risk of fibrosis. Fibrosis with varying severity. Some patients have only radiological lesions, some patients have clinical lesions. But what is also known is that if you have fibrosis on imaging, and even if it's subclinical, it is a risk marker for mortality. So having fibrosis after ARDS is something important to know. The question that remains is regarding COVID-19 survivors after ARDS secondary to COVID-19, what is the risk of fibrosis? And this risk currently, we don't know it. We don't know it because we do not have enough time after the initial uh, ICU stay. So here are some examples of potential evolutions. We have what we can call a good evolution. Patients have initial lesion ground glass opacities, and then after a few days, it goes to crazy paving and consolidation. And then after a few weeks, it goes back to a step of ground glass opacities, and then we hope to recovery full recovery. But we also see another type of evolution which could be called the bad evolution. Patients have initial lesions such as ground glass opacities or consolidation and then instead of going back to ground glass opacities and full recovery, they go to fibrosis. And the question is how can we, um, how can we screen these patients to see which one are going to fibrosis and which one are going to recovery. And the real question is when should we follow up this patient? Because if we follow up too early or too late, then it's a, chain, a lose of chance for them. So two very quick example here. This patient, he had, you see the initial chest CT on the left. So he had very severe critical extension, more than 75%. And he was followed very early because he was included in a clinical trial. And you can already see that only 15 days after the initial chest CT, we have a dramatic decrease in the lesions and some ground glass opacities, some little bit of fibrotic lesion, but we don't know if this will uh, persevere in future follow-ups. On the contrary, on another example, so this one, this patient went to ICU, on the left the initial chest CT, on the right chest CT after 26 days, so almost a month. And you see that they have, you had an evolution towards fibrosis and organizing pneumonia. So the real question, and to be honest I have no answer, is when we should follow these patients. That's something to be debated. Thank you. I think we are open for questions from the floor. Yeah, like Michael, thank you very much for this for sharing your wealth of of experience here.
Uh, we got already some questions and I invite, invite all of you to send in more questions. And they are focusing primarily on how do you examine your patients? What is your standard protocol on a C, on a CT, apparently a CT protocol for patients coming from the ICU, looking for complications? So what is your protocol here? So we have two options. Either we go with uh, low dose non-enhanced chest CT or either we go with uh, a CT pulmonary angiography. So for patients with ICU, and this is something that will, will be developed by Anand uh, right after that, we have always to look for a pulmonary embolism. So for ICU patients, we always do CTPA. But for follow-up imag imaging, and particularly if the clinical evolution is good, we only do low dose CT and we try to optimize the acquisition protocol so as not to uh, have an over radiation of the patient. So we aim at a DLP of around 50 for like um, normal morphological patients. Thank you very much. And you mentioned already nobody knows how and when to follow these patients. What, what would be your recommendation now? First CT scan after eight weeks or no routine follow up? What would you think of here? So this patients leaving the ICU is not based. Yeah, yeah, it's not based on uh, COVID nineteen, but it's based on prior experience and other type of ARDS. And we think that before three months, it's probably too early because you will have images, and we know that even in COVID nineteen patients, we have images whatever ground glass or organizing pneumonia that can stay up to six, eight weeks after the initial episode. And that would still possible to completely regress at later follow-up. So not too early. And I think three months in patient after uh, ARDS or after severe COVID-19 requiring hospitalization, I think that is uh, probably a good, uh, a good time point. I think you're raising a very important question here or a point here that it is really hard to predict the course in these patients and also for, for, for us it is uh, the, the intensive care doctors frequently ask if something you see there is irreversible and we see a large bronchi and it's not that easy to say if this is irreversible, this could be reversible due to organizing pneumonia. So what is your suggestion here? How do you explain this to your intensive care doctors? Mm, very simply, we have to say very humble, we still don't know. So we know that we see a lot of images during the acute phase and we are not sure that these images will remain. Um, we have seen patients that went to uh, ICU, had ARDS, and we've seen them six weeks later for follow-up and almost all lesions were gone. So this is definitely not something that is fixed and we have really to stay very humble and just to follow them, not too early, not too late, and see what will happen. I completely agree with that. There's a question coming in. What is what is your suggestion to follow patients on intensive care unit, chest radiographs, how often, and when do you suggest it to perform a chest CT? So that's also a good question. Of course, we <laughs> yeah. see much more with chest CT, definitely, but chest X-ray is mostly managed by the intensivists. So they use it whenever they have to look for lines or to uh, follow up for effusion or stuff like that. So basically, it's really not your your role to say, okay, you have to do chest CT, a chest X-ray every two days or every five days. They manage it very well, and I think you have to leave them for that. But regarding chest CT, uh, that's a difficult question. Of course, if it was very easy, it would be extremely interesting to have maybe every week or every two weeks, but it's not that easy and usually we do it only when we need it, when there is clinical degradation and when you suspect something else, but not systematically and then, for sure. Last but not least, a very tough question. Catenone described two types of ARDS in patients uh, with COVID-19, one with low compliance and one with high compliance. Do you see difference in, mm -hmm. on differences on CT? 
uh, yes, actually, they describe difference in city as well. Some with uh, mostly ground glass and some with uh, more dense lesions. So we had this in the beginning because we had some patients that went to ICU with very little or very uh, small uh, lesions and uh, lesion extensivity. And some patients that went to ICU with uh, almost the whole lungs that were consolidated. So we see that. Is, the, is there a difference in the prognosis for this patient? To be honest, I don't know. Okay, thank you very much. I think we can move on now to the next speaker. Uh, Anand, would you give your presentation that, so that we can discuss later the many questions that came in already? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Helmut, I'm going to uh, present on pulmonary embolism and COVID-19 and uh, just share some of uh, my experiences of imaging CTPA in patients with COVID-19. Uh, our experience in my institution is primarily one of patients with severe acute respiratory failure. Uh, it's a tertiary referral unit for patients with acute respiratory failure. Um, as well, and I'm also going to share um, some of the literature on this subject. So, um, as I just wait for the uh, first slide to come up. Yeah, so this is one of the um, earlier papers in the literature on uh, pulmonary embolism and COVID-19 from early on in the pandemic from Italy. And at that time, um, the question was asked, is acute pulmonary embolism and COVID-19 pneumonia a random association? Well, we now know with the wealth of evidence that has accumulated since that publication that it's not a random association. There is a strong association between uh, pulmonary embolism and indeed all thrombotic phenomena and COVID-19. And uh, what a number of publications have shown is that the rate of PE in patients undergoing CTPA admitted with COVID-19 is in the order of about one quarter to one third of patients. And uh, this has been <clears throat> reproduced in a number of studies. It's also uh, a similar figure to our own experience. There's also um, a wealth of evidence that's accumulated to suggest that um, this is not just a question about pulmonary embolism in COVID-19, but a question of hypercoagulation in COVID-19 pneumonia. And these parameters that suggest this phenomenon of hypercoagulation include the observation of very high D-dimer levels in patients with COVID-19, uh, one study reporting in excess of 20,000 D-dimer levels in 39% of patients. Uh, just for reference, the normal D-dimer level uh, is, of course, closer to around 500. There's also the observation that patients are undergoing thrombotic events despite prophylactic anticoagulation. And we've also observed uh, the presence of pulmonary embolism in a, a number of patients without evidence of peripheral DVT, suggesting there may again be a primary thrombotic uh, uh, problem going on. So the P's that we see in uh, COVID-19 pneumonia are um, often segmental or subsegmental, such as in this example here, but also um, I'd say this, this is probably the majority of patients, but a significant minority of patients also have quite severe clot burden more proximally. And uh, what I've observed is that often the clot that we see in these patients more proximally often has an irregular look to it, uh, almost mimicking chronic, thromb chronic thrombus in chronic thromboembolic disease. Clearly, it's not chronic uh, in patients with COVID-19, but the appearances certainly uh, do mimic that uh, appearance that we're more familiar with in chronic thromboembolic disease of irregular, sometimes peripheral thrombus. Uh, another example, again, a very irregular peripheral thrombus in the left main pulmonary artery. This patient is a uh, patient on ECMO, hence the uh, under-ventilated lungs, if you like, with complete uh, pacification of both lungs. Now, the treatment of pulmonary embolism is, of course, not a question for us, but uh, is based on a number of factors, including uh, 
hypercoagulability, the risks of hemorrhage, and so forth. But there are reports of uh, thrombolysis being effective in patients with large clot burdens and very high D-dimers. And um, uh, this patient, in fact, uh, was thrombolyzed. And uh, as you can see here on the dual energy CTPA study that was performed before and after, even though the uh, clot remains in the uh, left low low pulmonary artery after thrombolysis, you see a substantial improvement in uh, uh, perfusion uh, with uh, the previous iodine defect in the left lower lobe and indeed elsewhere uh, improving following thrombolysis. Just want to move on to parenchymal signs that we see related to the vasculature in uh, COVID-19. And there have been a number of reports now in the literature uh, describing this observation of dilated subsegmental vessels in patients with COVID-19. Others have called it vascular thickening or vascular congestion seen in up to 89% of patients. And uh, this is also something that we've seen probably in a similar amount, maybe not as high as 89%, in our patients with severe uh, respiratory failure due to COVID-19. And um, these uh, dilated subsegmental vessels are these sorts of uh, things that I've highlighted on these images here, peripheral branching vessels um, that uh, mimic, if you like, tree and bud uh, nodularity, but um, are very much centered on the vessels. And we refer to this as uh, tree and bud vascular tree in bud. Now, this is something that has been um, described previously uh, by Franket and colleagues back in 2002, in fact, who described the vascular tree in bud sign with a very similar appearance um, on, on CT of this branching peripheral opacities. And um, that, that uh, paper described this phenomenon as correlating with thrombotic microangiopathy in patients with tumor emboli. And just um, one final thing to say is that uh, the, the thrombotic hypercoagulable state that we see in COVID-19 is not just pulmonary embolism. There are also reports of increased rates of ischemic stroke, uh, myocardial infarction, concomitant aortic pulmonary and cardiac thrombus. And here's an example of a patient who has uh, aortic thrombus, almost freestanding aortic thrombus, very unusual to see uh, freestanding aortic thrombus in patients who don't have aortic atheroma. Uh, but again, pointing towards um, all features pointing towards a hypercoagulable state in these patients. Uh, so that's my last side helmet. Um, I'll hand back to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really liked your British understatement of calling completely consolidated lungs as underventilated. <laughs> that was absolutely no <laughs> ventilation. <laughs> uh, we have a number of questions and we have to answer them. And let's start off with how to look for um, pulmonary embolism. One is uh, a couple of colleagues asked, do you spec CT or ventilation perfusion uh, scintigraphy to look for uh, pulmonary embolism in patients with renal failure in these patients in COVID? Yeah, uh, okay. So um, in our institution, we rely on CTPA. Um, spec, C, spec CT can also be used, and we've used it uh, previously in other patient groups, but I, I don't have any experience of using it in this particular setting, not least because of logistics. Um, should be said that uh, many of the patients that um, we perform CTPA on, such as the ones that I've shown you, are, uh, if they do indeed have renal dysfunction, are on filtration anyway. Uh, it's it's a good question, but it's not something I have experience on. And the follow-up question would be uh, dual energy. You showed nice, beautiful images with dual energy. So do you routinely use dual energy CT to look for pulmonary embolism, in particular here in this situation? Yeah, we previously used it in selected groups um, when we do CTPA for other reasons. In this particular cohort, we uh, used it initially and then began to use it more frequently. We noticed uh, a high incidence of perfusion defects that didn't necessarily correlate with uh, the, uh, the clot burden. Uh, 
all pointing towards the uh, phenomenon of uh, microthrombi. So that's something that we've incorporated into our practice and um, our clinicians use that information along with a variety of other factors, as I mentioned, in risks of bleeding and so forth when it comes to making the decision, uh, the level of DVIMAS, et cetera, but when it comes to making the decision about uh, uh, anticoagulation. But um, it's uh, something that we're still trying to understand what, um, uh, what the perfusion defects that we're seeing in these patients represent on dual energy, but uh, I think um, we'll probably uh, learn more about it as, as other groups also um, collect their data. I think that's a really important point you're raising, and I think we should uh, look for uh, autopsies also in these patients to understand what we are seeing on, on our pictures, because that is something that would translate also then to the interpretation of other patients. Um, so most of, uh, where do you see the primary emboli? In more in the central located or are the segmental primary emboli more common? Yeah, I think um, probably uh, a slight predilection for peripheral pulmonary emboli in my experience um, with including a lot with subsegmental PEs. But some of these patients, uh, as I showed, do have quite dramatic uh, proximal clot with significant clot burden. And also importantly, a lot of these patients have very elevated uh, right heart pressures um, on echo. And uh, again, that's something that is different to traditional acute pulmonary embolism, where even in patients with right heart strain, the um, estimated pulmonary artery pressures um, never really get to the sort of levels that we're seeing here in patients with COVID, indicating there may be some, that there's a, perhaps subacute uh, nature to this uh, process. We can speculate as to why that might be, but it's certainly an observation that uh, we've made in our unit. And you mentioned already the in situ formation of thrombi in, in pulmonary arteries. How often do you suspect it? I know you, you can't prove it, but how often do you suspect it in your routine? Yeah, it was um, one of those things where uh, it's only once um, we started looking for it that we, we started seeing it more often. And, um, you know, that the paper quoted 89%. I wouldn't say we, we see it in as many patients as that. Um, remember, our practice is very much towards the more severe end of the spectrum. But I, I would say we see it in close to 50%, maybe more than that, um, of patients. Uh, and uh, it can vary from just a one or two segments of vasculotrine bud to some patients where it really is very florid, occupying multiple segments. And um, as you say, we can't uh, be sure what it correlates with, but even some, re some uh, recent autopsy data uh, in COVID has also pointed towards um, thrombi within the peripheral vasculature being present as a common phenomenon. Okay, and uh, one colleague asked whether the uh, some of the parenchymal changes we see in COVID-19 patients might be the result of pulmonary embolism and some of the fibrotic changes probably as well. So what's your take on that? Yeah, it's uh, difficult to, s to be sure about that. I mean, um, we know even now before COVID that patients, uh, 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 as Mikhail uh, elegantly showed, um, for example, influenza ARDS, that we know these patients develop organizing pneumonia even without the problems of pulmonary embolism. So I think they're probably two separate uh, pathologies which are coexisting in some patients. Okay. And the next question would be on the, the follow-up of patients on the intensive care unit. Do you, not you, but your colleagues follow the uh, uh, patients with the dimer monitoring and is there a threshold when to send a patient to CT to a CT scan, or is it just the clinical uh, features which guide it, that? Mm. Well, in the more severe end of the spectrum, patients who are ventilated with ARDS, um, I think because the frequency of pulmonary embolism is reported as being so high, we certainly uh, routinely perform CT and CTPA uh, cl close or soon after ventilation. 
And then after that, it's very much guided by the patient's progress. But the other important thing about doing a, a CT close to ventilation is you have a, a baseline CT that enables you to use CT as a means of, of disease monitoring. Earlier on in the in the piece, um, I think uh, CT is you know has its uh, advantages and disadvantages, and Mikhail showed its ability to prognosticate. But I think for, as far as CTPA is concerned, I don't have a D dimer level. Uh, to suggest there was one paper that was published that suggested around about two and a half thousand D-dimer level was the optimum sensitivity and specificity for P in COVID. Um, uh, but uh, it, it really comes down to the clinician's judgment as to whether or not the patient's clinical condition can be expa explained by COVID pneumonitis, if you like, or whether there is uh, also something else driving the hypoxia, such as PE. That's a difficult question coming in, but an interesting one. Uh, in there have been reports on unusual skin rashes in COVID patients. Could that be also due to a peripheral embolism, or do you see any correlation? Do, mm -hmm. Did you observe that in your patient population as well? Um, I, I have to plead ignorance on on dermatology, but um, I, I do know in my reading of uh, uh, of the patholog pathological literature. Um, that there, there is also uh, uh, papers uh, and reference made to microthrombus, um, dermat subcutaneous and dermatological microthrombus. Whether that's the reason for the rash, I don't know. But uh, this phenomenon of uh, peripheral in situ thrombus formation, if that's what you want to call it, uh, affects the lungs, the kidneys, multiple organs, and including the uh, the skin. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one colleague is still asking about SPECT CT, and I'd like to move that question um, to Mikael, as you already answered your point of view here. Uh, what about a, performing just a perfusion uh, SPECT CT in patients with renal failure? Is that an option? Because ventilation is associated with a risk of contamination, but you could just perform a, a perfusion scan. Would that be an option, Mikael? There are two problems. Uh, the first problem is if you talk about ICU patients, so performing perfusion scan is very difficult logistically. So we don't do it in our institution. But if you talk about patient hospitalized in medicine ward, medical wards, then it depends on the level and the extensiveness of the parenchymal lesions. If you have very extensive parenchymal lesions, then the uh, perfusion uh, aspect will be quite difficult to analyze. So it depends. I'm not sure it's that sensitive in this kind of patients. Thank you very much. I know that you published in this field as well, Mikhail. Did you ever see saddle emboli in patients with COVID-19, meaning very central primary emboli? So saddle emboli, no. Proximal and in the main pulmonary trunk, yes, but saddle, no. OK. I think we stop here with that block, but please send in your questions. We will have time afterwards as well. And we'd like, I would like to uh, hand over the microphone to Miriam, and we will talk now about neurological consequences and complications in COVID-19. So thank you, Helmut. So yes, COVID-19 uh, can uh, also be responsible for neurological complications. And the first question uh, we can ask ourselves is why? So as you know, COVID-19 uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus needs the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor to gain entry inside the cells. So there are in fact two physiopathological mechanisms that have been suggested to explain neurological complications in terms of direct um, pathway of presence of virus inside the brain. And we will see that also there is an indirect cause of inflammation that can cause other um, disorders in the brain. So the first physiopathological mechanism is um, using the spread from the mechanoreceptors in the lung via a synapse connected route to uh, the medullary cardiorespiratory center. And the second is entering the brain primarily via the olfactory bulb. 
And the second um, hypothesis has been validated on other types of um, SARS-CoV virus um, and has been published more than 10 years ago. And uh, the hypothesis of this attempt of the olfactory bulb is sustained by first clinical symptoms such as anosmia. And you see um, in this group uh, publication, a uh, pan-European publication, um, in patients with uh, mild to moderate forms of COVID-19, sudden anosmia has been a symptom present in more than 80% of the patients. So it is now becoming uh, a symptom very specific of the COVID, especially uh, when the patient uh, um, report uh, anosmia without nasal obstruction or rhinorrhea. And it is also sustained by imaging publication showing abnormal T2 signal of olfactory bulbs. Brain lesions have started to be described in March this year. With this first article, describing acute hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalopathy. So acute hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalopathy are well-known post-viral complications, especially of influenza virus. And you can see those T2 flare hyperintensity um, within bilateral um, telomy and temporal lobes, and with evidence of hemorrhage with microbleeding here on this uh, T2 star sequence and enhancing um, lesions on postgadolinium sequence. So those um, hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalopathy have been related to intracranial cytokine storms. And this is uh, interesting because Cytokine storm syndrome has been recently reported in COVID-19 patients and may play a role in the development of those types of encephalopathy. Another example of the polymorphism that we can have of the different diseases uh, secondary to this COVID-19 uh, virus infection is this typical aspect of what we have called a cytotoxic lesion of the corpus callosum or clock in a patient uh, COVID-19 positive. So you see this uh, ovoid region of the splenium of the corpus callosum with in increased T2 flare signal, um, high DWI diffusion with the restricted ADC values, uh, and enhanced T1 on postgadolinium um, injection. So this is really typical of clock lesions, and clocks are known to be secondary to an underlying evolving cause, and the corpus callosum is very sensitive to markedly increased levels of cytokines. Mm -hmm. So both acute hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalopathy and clock suggest specific complications related to maladaptive cytokine profile. Different retrospective studies have been published and are underwriting, reporting the prevalence of neurological complications. One here in Strasbourg and one here in Wuhan. So what those um, publications shows is that neurological manifestations may occur in 40 to 70% of hospitalized COVID-19 patients. But interestingly, it was the patient that were uh, hospitalized in ICU, so very severe cases. And in terms of neurological signs, agitation uh, was very frequent. And in terms of brain MRI, um, leptomeningeal enhancement, meningitis, perfusion abnormalities such as hyperperfusion and cerebral ischemic stroke have been noticed. Most frequently, um, when a lumbar function was done, the RT-PCR for SARS-CoV-2 in CSF was negative. Meanwhile, new case reports of rare complications are emerging, such as Guillain-Barré syndrome, myelitis, Miller-Fisher syndrome, and encephalitis.
Concerning stroke, um, there's a very interesting publication in the New England um, showing an association between COVID-19 and increased incidence of stroke because of pro-inflammatory and pro-thrombotic disease. So as we have already spoken of this uh, microthrombus uh, potential, uh, the brain is also very sensitive to that and it can explain emergent large vessel occlusion that can be detected as an early stage or sometimes even a presenting symptom. However, um, those uh, two studies, one from the US and one from France, shows both that the number of stroke patients decreased um, within uh, the pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, this is in France, so you can see here that this curve is uh, the number uh, of uh, uh, patient-related uh, COVID-19 hospitalization. And here is the daily number of patients receiving uh, thrombectomy. And uh, we noticed all over France a 21st decrease, a 21st percent decrease of mechanical thrombectomy um, within the quarantine. So this is something that can be questioned too, uh, comparing the, the significant increase in care delays. So we have seen different types of uh, clinical presentation and that's what is interesting and quite difficult for neurological um, attempts. Anosmia and abnormalities of olfactory bulb are usually linked to mild to moderate symptoms. It is often isolated without other neurological deficits and most often without any other abnormalities on MRI. So apart from anosmia and mild to moderate symptoms, then we enter um, patient with more severe complication. Maladaptive cytokine profile, as we have seen with clocks, leptomeningitis, encephalitis, hypoxic and thromboembolic lesions. Those have been really reported linked to critically ill patients. In a second phase, oh, sorry, in a second phase of the disease, inflammatory lesions can appear, and we have to watch for them very carefully. And to conclude, I would say that there is, especially for neurological complication, a need for a global view of the disease and an epidemiological follow-up, and also an importance of uh, understanding the physiopathological hypothesis to be validated on uh, post-mortem studies. If you have any questions. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing your, your uh, large expertise here. There are a number of questions coming in already. And uh, mm -hmm. one would be, is there a correlation between the uh, severity of the disease outside the brain and the development of encephalitis? So that's a very good question. Um, what we can say is that uh, having a neurological complication is a marker of modality, but is not always linked to the severity of um, the lung um, abnormalities. Um, but it is definitely something to look for. I think um, we have two different cases. The first um, when the patient is very severe because of the lung attempt and has neurological complication, that can happen in ICU in very severe cases. But there are also patients with a not that severe lung attempt and uh, presenting neurological complication. Even sometimes uh, it is suspected that a sudden death uh, or um, cardiorespiratory arrest can happen because of a neurological uh, abnormality, especially on the posterior fossa uh, and cranial nerves uh, abnormalities um, without, uh, uh, without a very severe uh, lung attempt. And what is your practical approach here? If uh, the intensive care 
let's say, calls you and they say they have a patient with suspicion of a neurological involvement. Do you go first to CT to look for stroke? And if you don't see it, you go directly to MR to look for a, uh, even again, stroke and encephalitis. Or so what is your protocol? And if you go to MR, what is your MR protocol without going into details here? Yes. So uh, if the symptom is very acute, then you think uh, it could be a stroke. And then the patient enters uh, the stroke process, whether you usually do CT, CTA, or MR. For example, in our institution, we usually do MR. Um, if the patient doesn't present an acute palsy, but presents uh, an agitation or headaches, or um, confusion is also very frequent, uh, then uh, you would be looking for uh, subtle abnormalities as those uh, that can only be seen by MR. And in this case, I would suggest directly uh, to do an MR because CT will not completely rule out uh, abnormalities. And for the MR protocol, um, I think, of course, diffusion flare are the two main uh, sequence of interests because the encephalitis uh, present a lot of um, micro bleeding or hemorrhage complication. You should add a T2 star, and if you can uh, use uh, post gadolinium uh, sequences with a 3 dt one to look for leptomeningitis and enhancing lesions. Thank you so much. You mentioned hemorrhage against encephalitis, but there are also other reasons for bleeding in the brain. Is the, how often do you see a, a hemorrhagic transformation after um, ischemic events, after stroke? So um, for COVID-19, um, I can't answer this question um, because the number of stroke reported are not that often. Um, I think really it's more, it, it's not the, the, the complication of a hemorrhagic bleeding secondary to stroke, in a COVID-19 patient, but more really linked to the, the type of encephalitis. And do you see any, or suspect any link to the anticoagulation these patients get because of the hypercoagulative state? This is a difficult question to answer, um, but when you do an MR and if there is no encephalitis patient do not have uh, bleeding lesions. So I would rather say, um, of course, there's a blood brain barrier rupture, um, and uh, this increases the risk of uh, intracranial bleeding. Uh, but it is really important for the patient to be correctly treated as we have seen how frequent um, embolism can be in this uh, disorder because of the pro-inflammatory uh, consequences of the virus. Yeah, that's a particular difficult with the uh, ECMO patients and intensive care. Then, a number of co colleagues asked uh, about the uh, if there is anything that pretty uh, which increases the risks for the development of a stroke, like diabetes or other risk factors. Are you aware of any? Um, the only thing that can be said on uh, COVID-19 from, uh, from now is that uh, it has been suspected uh, to be um, linked to the severity of uh, the, the disease. Uh, so usually it can be in stroke patient. Um, it has been reported that uh, dedima um, uh, increase uh, is a risk factor of stroke in those patients. So really it's the pro-inflammatory response of the global situation of the patient uh, that puts him more in danger of um, uh, having a stroke complication. And now we have a question which is, okay, that's more speculation, but that's good to hear speculation. Given the microthrombi seen elsewhere in COVID, is there going to be an epidemic of intracranial small vessel disease, dementia? That's, that uh, that's a I good question. That. I think, especially for brain, um, I think we are at the beginning of uh, what will be seen. Um, we may have inflammatory 
uh, disorders that may happen uh, a, a bit delayed uh, from the symptoms and uh, it's something we, we have to, to specifically take care now uh, as we are at two months from the beginning of the epidemics and it can happen from now on and white matter hyperintensity um, probably Probably also because um, on the, the paper um, published uh, by uh, uh, the Strasbourg team, they mentioned also that they have um, low perfusion. If they do, if the patient really uh, happened to have low perfusion without um, intracranial vessel occlusion, so um, just low perfusion on perfusion MRI, then uh, they may develop uh, secondary abnormalities of white matter um, diseases, definitely. So I think we will have to to wait and see, at least on the next six months, what will happen for those patients. Michael, as you have been one of the co-authors of the paper, which was just mentioned, what is your take on that? And will you follow patients with brain MR with special protocols, uh, maybe on a research project uh, in the next future? So the question that we had uh, in the beginning is uh, were the perfusion defects related to uh, the, uh, the fact that patients were ICU patients with lots of anesthetics? Or was they related to really something uh, uh, related to the, to the, to the virus infection and uh, we thought that uh, since we found this in almost all patients and in a uh, very uh, typical uh, localization then it might be related to itself and the question is how do you follow these patients and I think like Miriam we don't know yet uh, we had some patients with uh, extensive encephalitis and we followed them with MRI at two or three weeks and the uh, evolution was not that important. So it's probably like for chest CT, not too early, not too late, but when, we still don't know, I think. And that's a question to both of you. I think, what about the use of gadolinium? Miriam, you mentioned already that you are using it routinely in these patients. Uh, but there is also the uh, risk of gadolinium-based toxicity. We don't know about the long-term consequences of gadolinium. So do you think it's still indicated? This can be a yes or no in answer as well. So. Um, for this patient, I think it's really important to know if they have a neurological uh, attempt. So I would rather say um, yes, for the first time, definitely, especially as, for example, uh, leptomeningitis can be seen only on postgadolinium flare and T1 sequences. However, if you wish to follow them, and if uh, some patient has very uh, frequent MRI, then you can uh, suggest not to uh, do gadolinium injection on each MRI. It really depends on the number of MRI you're, you're uh, projecting for this patient. But at least for the first one, definitely yes. Michael, what's your take on that? Uh, we had some cases where uh, a brain MRI was really important for the intensivist because uh, they would base partly the decision on going on with the uh, with the intensive care or not on the evolution of the MRI lesions because it looks like it's something that is important for the whole prognosis of the patient. So uh, when we had a contrast uptake in the initial MRI and for this very severe patient, when we repeated the MRI, we also used uh, gadolinium just to see if the, the blood brain barrier was still permeable or not. So in my opinion for this very severe patient, uh, most likely a gadolinium toxicity is secondary. And do you see a role of MR spectroscopy in these patients? Michael? I have no experience in that, so I will let Miriam answer. Miriam? <laughs> There's an ongoing uh, study in France um, on, this, uh, on this very topic. And as I mentioned uh, before, I think the epidemiological uh, 
uh, studies are very important and um, within uh, the Société Française of uh, Neuroradiology, the SFNR, the Neurological French Society, um, we are conducting uh, several studies and uh, mainly uh, François Coton, uh, the president, and uh, Stéphane Kremer from Strasbourg. Um, and they pull the data from France and one of the topic is spectroscopy. I think spectroscopy can be interesting. Uh, perfusion MRI definitely also, um, and DTI. Now we're moving on to treatment. I don't. I know you're a radiologist, so it's probably not the main topic of your interest. But how do you treat, or how is encephalitis treated in these patients? Do you see a regression on MR than on the treatment? So uh, for the patient uh, that uh, we have followed um, in my institution, the real question for them, it, it, it's really severe patients. So the, the main question is the delay uh, for a wake up. And this is not very well understood. Um, so really, I don't know, uh, Michael, if you have noticed it also in Strasbourg and you, if you have uh, uh, this um, have, yeah. link of we very late cases, wake very, up. Very severe cases. Um, one or two, where they try to uh, treat it with plasma infusion and it didn't work that much. So it's only on one or two cases. So I don't know if we can generalize, but uh, for these very severe cases, the images stay the same at like two or three weeks. And two more neurological questions. One is, is there a territory which is more most affected in ischemic stroke? And what, then the second question is, do you, is are the complications linked to the presence of the virus within the brain? So to independent question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, for RTL territory, so no, um, not specifically, but uh, most of the stroke are uh, large uh, proximal strokes. Um, and for the second question, uh, this is a very important question. And uh, uh, we have to know if the virus is present within the brain or the CSF. And uh, we have to also validate uh, what we can know of epidemiological cases of MRI with post-mortem analysis. Because as I have mentioned, when we do uh, PCR on CSF, usually they are negative, but it doesn't mean that the virus is not present in the brain. And to be able to correctly treat those patients, especially for those who have neurological complications without uh, other uh, very important organ failures, um, we have to know if it's the presence of the virus that is responsible of the abnormalities or if it's more a consequence of the global um, patient. And have you seen or have you read about uh, dural venous, uh, the dural sinus venous thrombosis in these patients? They are not very frequently uh, reported. They don't seem to be a, a high number of uh, venous thrombosis in those patients. I think we, uh, there are more questions on the on general uh, radiology, meaning uh, lung. And I'd like to, to move on again, maybe move back to Anand, uh, if you have some more minutes for us. Uh, and two questions are in regard to what should we use to follow these patients, which imaging modality, and it is in two settings. One, in uh, in your country, for example, or in, 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 in Europe, uh, and then also in low income countries. So what are the methods of choice to, to, to do that? And uh, does chest radiograph, do chest radiographs also help us here? Um, so I think uh, if the, uh, the first um, test of choice, I think, in patients who are discharged, if we're talking about long-term follow-up of uh, people who've been discharged from hospital, is uh, is the chest X-ray. Um, that's re really coupled with clinical questioning. Are patients still breathless and so forth? Uh, 
if the chest x-ray or clinical questioning is abnormal, let's say at six to 12 weeks, three months after the uh, discharge, then at that point, uh, I think uh, further investigation can be recommended by way of lung function or six minute walk test or uh, and CT would be part of that um, protocol in the UK, for example. But I think the triage to get there is, is those other tests that I've mentioned first. The other thing to bear in mind, of course, is that those patients who've had embolic phenomenon, CTPAs showing Ps during their admission, uh, probably ought to have a CTPA instead of an HRCT uh, at three months. Um, so that yeah, that's that's what uh, we would do in the UK, I think. Thank you so much. Miguel, there are two questions which are also in the same spectrum. You mentioned already the prediction of the development of complications and uh, severe courses. Uh, what should you use in a low income country? Chest radiograph or still should focus on to go to CT? Uh, the same, similar question. And then uh, do you think AI can help us here? So regarding the first question, I think chest X-ray, if you don't have access to a chest CT or difficult access to chest, chest CT could help in predicting the severity and the extensiveness of the, uh, of the disease. Uh, I've also read some papers about uh, uh, ultrasound, lung ultrasound, that could help. But I think this is really only if you have difficult access to CT, CT remains the gold standard. And regarding AI, there has been a lot of interest for uh, analysis of initial chest CT by deep learning methods to uh, try to predict the risk of good or bad evolution. There are two problems for that. First is that the long-term evolution, we don't have it yet. And second is that the uh, amount of data needed uh, is not... Uh, available uh, apart from very specific uh, uh, database. So I think we're still waiting for the results of that. It's still in the, uh, in the process of doing it. Two more general questions, not in regard to complications, but uh, do you see T as one of a, a COVID-19 verification methods? So if a patient comes in with the symptoms of uh, COVID-19 test is negative to use CT. Uh, Mikhail, <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so if the symptoms are moderate to severe and if the swabs are negative, yes, we CT. Okay. But if the symptoms and are very limited, we do not CT. And one question to uh, Anand, if a patient comes in for a regular CT, abdominal CT, do you include also the chest? Uh, or would you suggest to do that because you're working as in a uh, chest center? But if a patient comes in with a uh, splint surgery or uh, orthopedic surgery, do you suggest to perform a CT scan of the chest as well to uh, exclude subclinical COVID-19? Yeah, there's been some uh, discussion about this in the UK, and I think um, it would be fair to summarize it as follows, which is that uh, if patient's having an abdominal CT anyway for, let's say, an acute abdomen and surgery is planned, then um, uh, thoracic CT uh, is, is done in addition to just the lung bases. And also in patients where there is a high risk of um, post-operative requirements for HD or ITU. So, uh, for example, cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, many of those patients will have had recent thoracic CTs anyway, but uh, the practice is to, to perform thoracic CT prior to um, uh, operation on those patients, of course, in conjunction with all the other tests that are required uh, to ensure that the patients are COVID-free. Two questions to Miriam. Uh, one is, is it important to differentiate uh, between encephalopathy versus infectious or immune encephalitis? Yes, so definitely. So for, for now on, um, um, the treatment options will not differ. But for understanding more and to adapt uh, the treatment, we must know uh, if it's direct or indirect uh, lesions 
of the virus of inflammatory or, or of the cytokine storm. Especially the cytokine storm is very important because uh, the treatment options might be different. Thank you so much. And there's a last question in regard to neurology. Uh, have you had improvements in patients who present with neurological symptoms with plasmapheresis or steroids post, uh, not post-intubation group? So on the treatment options, I cannot yet answer this. Uh, what I can tell is that uh, it's a real risk marker of mortality, uh, but some patient with neurological deficit and abnormal MRI still survived, and we have to, to have for them their follow-up. So, but it's really uh, an opening uh, in really uh, a severe case when they have neurological symptoms, even though uh, they don't have a, uh, an important uh, chest uh, or uh, global um, abnormalities. Thank you very much. There are a couple of questions in regard to the use of plain chest radiographs. Uh, this is something we will tackle next week. Next week, we will focus also on chest radiographs. So I'd like to invite you to hear the answers to that, these questions next week. And I think we are almost through. There's one colleague who asked about uh, the recurrence of COVID-19 in patients who already had COVID-19 apparently. Did you, have you seen that? And uh, what would you su suggest to do uh, to investigate that from an imaging point of view? Anand, I give you the oh, thanks for that. question now. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, no, I, mean. <laughs> I haven't seen uh, COVID recurrence in somebody who's already had COVID. Um, I guess that's as much an immunological question as a radiological one, but um, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, we will see that. What we will see is um, patients who've had COVID who, uh, who present with uh, ongoing symptoms, no doubt, uh, weeks and months after discharge. And there's one question to Mikael. And what about the uh, CT pattern leading to fibrosis? Can I tell you anything about that? Is ground glass always something that's safe that does not develop into fibrosis? Or is it just consolidation? Or is it just too early to answer these questions? Mm, we would have thought that if you have only ground glass, that this is something that is not as a uh, strong marker of leading to fibrosis and heavy consolidations. But uh, to be honest, uh, the evolution of the lesion is extremely fast. And we've seen a lot of examples of patients that had one day only from glass opacities and that were scanned hours or stay just one or two days later and that they evolved to a very extensive uh, consolidation. consolidation. So with the initial chastity, it's not that easy to have a prediction of what will happen. You have to be very cautious because in severe cases, it could evolve very, very quickly. And final question for today. I don't know if you've seen that, but we, we got reports from the US primarily on the association of COVID-19 and Kawasaki syndrome. Have you seen that already? Mike, Mika? Not or yet. Me, we had one suspicion uh, in one patient, not sure it was that. Okay. Okay. I think with that, we answered all the questions who came in. I'd like to thank all of you very much for this really exciting and really informative uh, lectures and discussion. And I'd like to invite all of you again to, to join us next week. Next week, we'll focus on chest radiographs. We will do this in, in joint uh, um, fashion with the uh, radiological technicians. And with that, I'd, I wish all of you a nice evening and see you in our conference in the next time, hopefully. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.